This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So, having looked at the objectives of our entity, so whether that's not for profit, uh, for profit, whether that's looking at listed businesses, whether that's looking at private businesses, what we're going to go through and do now is we're going to try and evaluate the financial objectives. Now, if we're thinking about financial objectives, I suppose that's much more geared towards, isn't it, looking at for profit entities? Because for profit entities are clearly trading to try and make a profit on an annual basis, to go through and see that profit grow on an annual basis so if targets are met we need to be able to ensure that we can meet those financial objectives so what we've got here uh, just bits and pieces that we're going to go through and get you involved a little bit more uh, than what you might have been previously in other subjects because a lot of this that we see within this section of evaluating your financial objectives is actually using knowledge brought forward from F2 so particularly looking at ratios from your analysis and interpretation and also going through as well and thinking a little bit about what we saw in terms of some of the formulae that you use from your weighted average cost of capital calculations uh, that we went through there and previously saw uh, in your earlier studies. Uh, and what we're going to look at first is looking, as I mentioned there, at ratios and growth trends uh, before we then go through there and pick it up in a little bit more detail by looking at something slightly differently, which is looking at the investor ratios, which was touched upon a bit, wasn't it, in F2, but the focus more in F2 was on profitability and position. So looking at liquidity, solvency, working capital ratios here, you know, financial objectives, we're going to start looking at investor ratios because if we meet those financial objectives, the investors will be happy and therefore the share price will go up and therefore there will be more value within the business, won't there? OK, so let's pick things up, first of all, uh, within the notes there by looking at your ratios and growth trends. Uh, so clearly uh, we're going to look at ratios to start off with. It mentioned margins and gearing. So I think the second example goes through there and looks at gearing, because, again, if a company later on is looking to take out more debt, we want to ensure there that it doesn't breach any potential covenants that we already have with regards to the level of gearing already in place within the entity. And then when we're looking at growth trends, we can start looking there at whether or not the earnings are growing at a particular rate uh, or the dividends themselves are growing at a rate that is keeping up with the growth in your earnings. If you're an investor and you are looking at a growth in dividends, that growth in dividends you would hope would match that growth in earnings or maybe even better. it. But again, that brings about issues for the company in terms of whether or not there are then sufficient profits to pay out that higher growing dividend. But we'll, we'll touch upon all that as, as we get there. So first of all, uh, example that we've got there, all about your ratio calculations. Uh, I think this one there is thinking more about is it your growth? So we're going to go through there and work out is it the compound average growth rate? So compound is not looking at it from year to year. It's looking over a period of years. OK, so here we're going to be looking at is it from X3 to X6? OK, uh, we're going to compound it up from X3 to X6. Uh, the key bit within this question, you've got to be very careful. Is that it's looking at your growth in your earnings per share? OK. Uh, not in your earnings because, you know, you look at your earnings there and you think, well, look, yeah, it's great, isn't it? My earnings have grown. Is it from $10.4 million up to $17.2 million? Fantastic. Uh, you could work out a compound average growth for, for that three years worth of growth, but it's looking at your earnings per share. Yeah, so you need to work out your earnings per share. Is it for X3? Uh, and then is it x6 and then what we can go through and think about there is remember that formula that we went through and used previously uh was it there in the glory days of your previous studies i can never remember is it f1 f2 that weighted average cost of capital is in uh i think it's in f2 isn't it yeah it's in f2 uh but what you've got there when you went through and looked at your growth rate and your historic growth rate in your dividends, we looked at the nth root of the dividend now divided by the dividend n years ago, and we subtracted one, didn't we? Okay, does that sound familiar? 
a couple of nods of the head, a couple of, I can't remember F2, Chris, I've passed it, I don't care. Uh, well, here you have it. That was the formula that we used to work out the historic growth in your dividends, wasn't it? Okay. Well, what we're looking at now is we're looking at not the historic growth in your dividends, but the historic growth in your earnings per share. So your earnings per share to date, I think, was X6, wasn't it? Your earnings per share three years ago, there was three, wasn't it? Okay. Subtract one. Okay. Uh, have a go. Okay. Uh, what you've got within the question, uh, we've got, is it three years of growth from X3 to four to five to six to four to five to six? So N is equal to three, isn't it? Uh, you can work out your earnings per share, doing your earnings divided by the number of shares. And then you can do that for both X3 and is it X6? Okay, have a go uh, and see how you get on. Okay, right. Hopefully we'll have a go at that there. Okay, uh, and then I can come back in if we start the video. Uh, no. So what did you get? I think the answer is about 3.3%. If memory serves me right, is your average compound growth. So what you've got there, your growth rate is the nth root. So M was equal to three, wasn't it? Uh, your dividends per share in X6 was it 17.2 over 150. And then in X3, it was 10.4 divided by 100. Okay, and then subtract one. Uh, it's tricky to use your calculator. Uh, so hopefully you're happy using your calculator now because you've done similar calculations previously in F2. But the way in which I'd do it is I'd do the 17.2 divided by the 150. Okay, and get that on your calculator. I then do divide and then open up a set of brackets on your calculator and do 10.4 divided by 100. Close the bracket and then press equals. Okay. And then what I would do is I would do three second function. It's normally a second function when you're doing the nth root of something. So three second function nth root of your answer. Okay. Because uh, you can use your previous answer, can't you? As you use your calculator, press equals and then subtract one. Okay. If you tap that onto your calculator, your compound average growth rate should be there. Is it at 3.3%? Okay. Excellent. Nice and straightforward. At least I hope it was. Uh, then what we've got, uh, the second example uh, here is looking at your gearing. So calculate Cavendish's gearing. Again, gearing is one of those funny ratios, isn't it? Because it's not formally defined. OK, so within the exam, they would have to tell you whether it is debt over equity or debt over debt plus equity. Uh, here, we're specifically told that it is debt over equity and it also wants us to use market values, okay? Uh, so it goes on to say, Cavendish is financed by a mixture of debt and equity, both of which are traded on public markets. Hence, there is a market value for each. Uh, it has 1 million equity shares in issue, which are currently trading at $1.74. That's nice and easy, isn't it? Uh, clearly taking a bit of pity on you there. Uh, so what you've got there is your gearing is equal to your debt over your equity. Well, we know there that your equity is that the 1 million multiplied by $1.74 per share, okay? Uh, and $1.5 million, so that's the par value of your redeemable bonds that are trading at 97% per dollar. So for every dollar of bonds, uh, they are worth 97 cents. So here, what you've got there is it your $1.5 million. We multiply, is it by 0 0.97? Okay. Uh, again, just check that on my calculator. 1.5 times 0 0.97. Uh, does that give me $1.455 million uh, divided by... I won't use my calculator for this one. 1.74 million. I can get that one. Well done, Christopher. 
uh, tapping that into your calculator goes through there and gives you is it 0 0.84 okay or if you like 84 percent okay uh, 0 0.84 to 1 if you like uh, so for every dollar of equity there is 84 cents of debt within this business okay uh, how that could be then used uh, it is, you know, we may, might set a financial objective that we need to keep the level of debt to equity, the level of gearing below a particular target. OK, so if our target was 0 0.75, then we are above that gearing level. And therefore, we have not met that financial objective. Similarly, with my earnings per share, if we had set a growth rate historically of 4% in the past, uh, We've only made 3.3% over those three years. Then we've not met that target. So I think that's where exam questions will, will challenge you, not just to calculate the numbers, but also try and understand their meaning and what they're all about. OK, uh, the best way to get good at these questions, again, like I've said on previous topics, is to practice the questions in your chosen providers revision kit. Yeah, you, There'll be questions on gross margins, operating margins, uh, gearing, interest cover, all the ratios that you've seen before, okay? Uh, so it's just repetition in terms of the recalculation of them. And then you will need to go through there and maybe just apply it to a particular scenario. Other than that, looking at your ratios and growth trends, I think should be a good area of the syllabus for you to score marks in.